excuse me. We've got a little bit of a mix up here, but sometimes things like that happen. And, uh, you know, to be able to go and to live the Bible for an entire year by its rules. So what was your thinking when this inspiration came across your desk or in bed or when you woke up from a dream? or When when, when did this happen? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, well, it happened... uh... It happened a couple of years ago, and uh, and it led to the most fascinating year of my life. I'm really, it was a uh, it was a, a, an incredibly challenging year, but I learned so much. Uh, it happened. I I think I got the inspiration because I love to dive into these projects head first. Uh, that's what I, the kind of writing I like to do is is immersing myself in the topic. Uh, so. For my previous book, I I, wrote, I read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica from A to Z. And wow. To learn everything. <laughs> so that was uh, something. And uh, I also work for Esquire magazine, and I wrote a piece called My Outsourced Life, where I hired a team of people in Bangalore, India, to live my life for me. So they answered all my email and answered my phone and argued with my wife for me. So this is the kind of thing I like to do, and I thought, what is the what is the biggest, most meaningful book uh, that I could immerse myself in? And it and it was the Bible. So that was my project. I know when you think about it too, especially this day and age with the internet that's available, that you know the secular church just doesn't seem to have the kind of strength or power that it seemingly used to have as far as deciding how one should live, and if you're not living by the rules of that particular church, wherever it may be, you know, then some really bad things can happen to you. And you see people beginning to scratch their heads and saying, well, you know, you're still bringing old world views into this world, and, you know, how is that relevant today? So you tend to see and sense a lot of confusion, like, you know, should we continue this way? Or, you know, what sort of relevance does the Bible have in our living day-to-day society and so you must have come up with some interesting answers as you were reading through cover to cover well it was fascinating uh to me and uh and and i i tried to live by all the rules without picking and choosing uh and what was surprising was how relevant some of the rules were to my life into the 21st century even though this book is thousands of years old uh and yet then there were other rules that uh were so foreign and baffling to our 21st century (laughs) mind. Uh, So I tried to follow everything. I just, I read the Bible from cover to cover, and I wrote down every single rule I could find. So, uh, you know, I wanted to follow the Ten Commandments. Uh, I wanted to follow love your neighbor, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, And by the way, my wife and I did have twins during the year, so I, I take my projects very seriously. Uh, but I also wanted to follow some of the obscure uh, ones that people don't talk about, uh, like uh, don't shave your beard. So by the end, I had this beard that uh, uh, basically I spent a lot of time at airport security. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also uh, wanted to follow the rules about, uh, there's a rule that says you cannot wear clothes made of mixed fibers. Uh, and it sounded crazy, but I figure, why not try it? So I uh, imagine John Travolta of Saturday Night Fever having to live by that one. That's true. He, that, he would be in <laughs> trouble. There's a lot of rayon uh, and polyester. Sorry, you can't do it according to the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so everything from that to uh, stoning adulterers. I even wanted to try that, see what that was like. So the whole thing uh, from from top to bottom. So, now, you said you stoned adulterers. How did you go about doing something like that without getting anybody hurt? Well, that was a challenge. Uh, uh-huh. I, uh, I uh, <clears throat> Basically, what happened was uh, it was later in the year, and I was wearing, towards the end of the year, I actually tried to dress like a biblical person because I wanted to try to really get into the mindset. So I had on my sandals and my robe, and I was walking around New York City where I live. And a man approached me and said, why are you dressed like that? And I explained, I'm trying to live by all the rules of the Bible, from the Ten Commandments to stoning adulterers. And he said, well, I'm an adulterer. Are you going to stone me? And I said, well, yeah, that would be great. So uh, I took out a handful of stones I'd actually been carrying in my pocket for just this occasion. I've been hoping to run into an adulterer. And uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> and he he actually they were very small stones pebbles because I figured this is my uh, my loophole I could at least follow the letter of the law and he exactly uh, <laughs> he grabbed the stones out of my hand and threw them at my face so I felt in uh, sort of you know in retaliation an eye for an eye I could toss one back at him so that was uh, my experience stoning. Although, well, yeah, you know, it was uh, it was interesting, and it was actually in a, a bit of an intense confrontation. <laughs> and I'll it bet. did allow me to talk in a more serious way in the book about capital punishment in the Bible and, and how the Bible can be so wise and compassionate in some parts and yet so seemingly barbaric in others and, and how to reconcile that and, and what parts can we apply to our lives. So hopefully the book was entertaining, but it also tried to delve into these serious issues. Especially this day and age where, you know, you need something that kind of gives you some guidance of how to live alongside your brothers rather than chastise and cast out, you know, uh, those who may think differently from you, which you seem to see a lot of that, you know, it's the interpretation of a particular, you know, sect or a fundamentalist, you know, where they use certain parts of the Bible to kind of say, no, this is the way it's got to be, literally, uh, you know, and you kind of sit there and go, well, that seems so maddeningly, ridiculously, it just lacks common sense in some ways. But as you take a look at even fundamentalists, you know, they sort of literally try to interpret, you know, aspects of the Bible and, and live that direction, you know, with their own discipline. But what was your experience with that fundamentalist living, so to speak? Well, it was interesting because there were there were two motivations for doing the project. The first was uh, to go on to go on this earnest spiritual journey uh, to try to find out what uh, uh, what I could discover about religion. Because I grew up with very little religion at all. Uh, as it says in the book, I'm Jewish in the same way the Olive Garden is Italian. So not very. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> uh, but I, I felt uh, I had a son and I wanted to see what to teach him about religion. So I decided to embark on this spiritual journey to to find out what I could apply to my life from the Bible. Uh, but at the same time, I was also concerned about the fundamentalism that you talk about and people who say they interpret the Bible literally. Uh, and and uh, so I, in a sense, decided to take that to the extreme and see what happens if you take the entire Bible literally and, and really do try to live it without picking and choosing. Um, and, and I found that living by the Bible literally is maybe not the best way to approach the Bible. The Bible has lots of meaning and compassion and wisdom, but if you if you insist on taking every word literally, then you miss out on a lot of that. Now, as you were reading the Bible, and you did read the Bible cover to cover, is that my understanding? Right. Okay. What was your experience like in reading this where you thought to yourself, because you said that you grew up with not a whole lot of religion around you, but I'm sure you had exposure to religion around you as you were growing up uh and you you know what was that like to read and go you know i didn't know that or you know really was that the way it really was i mean it must have been quite an eye-opener for you oh a huge eye-opener uh several things one was uh the reading uh the old testament about these old testament patriarchs the uh and just how human they were i mean these were not perfect men and women Mm -hmm. They had uh, real flaws, uh, you know, David, even David, who was a great king, uh, you know, he was tempted by Bathsheba, and, and he fell. So they all had these struggles, so it was very interesting to be able to relate to them and, and just how complex their characters were. And and also I was surprised by, as I say, how how relevant a lot of, uh, a lot of the Bible's teachings were to my life, even though... You know, I had seen it as a very ancient book with with little relevance. The, the the parts about, for instance, coveting and lying and gossiping, uh, really spoke to me because I live in New York uh, and I work in the media. So coveting and lying and gossiping is like, you know, that's what we do. Here. <laughs> that's how you make your living. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sadly, <laughs> <It's true. laughs> so trying to cut those out of my life was. It was a fascinating and uh, an enlightening experience, and and uh, you know I was never able to cut them out completely uh, because uh, you know it, it's just too tempting to covet. But uh, I think I was able to use the Bible to make some strides in in the right direction. 
And I'm sure that your uh, children or your your son, as you were saying earlier, must have had some questions too. Like, Dad, why are you wearing white all the time? What's this all about? <laughs> so true. <laughs> and the beard, he actually grew to like the beard. I was actually quite nervous when I shaved it off at the end of the year that he wouldn't recognize me. But uh, luckily he seems to have uh, retained some memory of me. So now what was the reason for having to wear the beard and let it grow out? What was the Bible's reason for that? Well, it's uh, it says in Leviticus that you shall not shave the corners of your beard. And since I didn't know which the corners were, I decided to let the whole thing grow. <laughs> I, it, it's one of those that does not actually have a... Um, an explanation. There are many rules in the Bible that don't have an explanation uh, that that just uh, say it. And and it was very interesting <clears throat> to follow those because in some cases uh, the rules that seemed completely baffling in the beginning turned out to to have quite a bit of wisdom to, by the end. Uh, and I, I'm thinking of uh, even something like uh, the Sabbath. I, I was a workaholic, and I still am to some extent. And working through the weekends, just you know, checking my email all the time, my BlackBerry. But here, the Bible says uh, that you must take a day off, a, a day of rest, to contemplate and spend with your family. And it was really hard. I I, I sort of had uh, withdrawal symptoms, and. Uh, oh. And it took me several weeks where, you know, first I was checking my email three times uh, on uh, on the weekend and then down to two times and then one time, and finally I was able to do it. But it was, a, it, you know, it turned out to be one of the best things about my year. Hmm. Yeah, I can see how that can actually help. Too many people trying to uh, get too submerged into what they're doing and they just don't take the moment to stand up, look around, and just take a nice deep breath and move forward. And uh, certainly the Sabbath helps you do that, even if it's forced upon you as a rule of the Bible. Now, <clears throat> as I'm saying here, it's uh, it, it tends to, the Bible that is, has a list of rules that runs, as it says here, about 72 pages, with more than 700 rules to live by. That's a pretty daunting list, and you tried to live by each of these rules, uh, all 700 of them, as best as you could within a year's time? Absolutely. And, and uh, you had a checklist in front of you, too. That must I have did. been amazing to huge, try to do that. I had a huge, uh, I had a huge uh, stack of papers with all of my rules, and, and it, it was amazing because it affected every single part of my life, the way I walked, wow. the way I talked, the way I... I thought the way I hugged my wife. Uh, I mean, there. One of the big challenges in the Old Testament is that there are rules about touching women, and that you can only touch women during certain times of the month. And even more, if you take it very strictly, you're not allowed to sit on a seat where a woman in her time of month has sat. And my wife thought this was quite offensive. Uh, so she sat on every seat in our apartment. Uh, <laughs> and I was forced to spend much of the year standing. Yeah. <laughs> so it really, the, Take the that back for punishing me for something that happens naturally. <laughs> I know, and I noticed here that one of the rules here that was interesting was if you were in a fist fight with another man and his wife grabs your private parts, his wife that is, you shall cut off her hand, and that's Deuteronomy 45, 11 through 12. And you said that's another rule that you won't find gra engraved outside of many courthouses. That's kind of an interesting rule in and of itself. Does that kind of follow along with potential adultery? Or? That one is an interesting rule, and that one I followed by... <laughs> Uh, default by not getting in a fight with a man whose wife was standing nearby looking like she had a strong grip. So uh, that one I, I did, I suppose, follow. But it's one of those rules that uh, that's sort of baffling uh, when you first come across it. Uh, and, and it's so interesting to see how different uh, religions and and religious leaders interpret that rule uh, because I did ask about it. It seemed so odd to me. And it ta a lot of them talk about how it's really, you should interpret it to mean don't embarrass people, uh, you know, and I guess grabbing private parts counts as embarrassment. Uh, because I, I did have a, a large spiritual advisory board, as I called mm -hmm. them. I had rabbis and priests and ministers of all stripes 
who tried to help me uh, with my journey because I knew this was a massive undertaking and I knew that uh, I, I, I could use all the help I could get. So uh, I loved talking to these people to find out how they interpreted these various Bible passages. And actually a large part of the book is is the time I spent embedding myself with different religious communities. So I spent a lot of time with evangelical Christians uh, and, and really learned some surprising things. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Hasidic Jews and the Amish. And I think I'm the first person to out Bible talk a Jehovah's Witness. He came, <laughs> came over to my apartment and uh, after three hours he looked at his watch and he said, I got to go. <laughs> That's unusual. <laughs> Usually they want to cook you dinner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I was just so enthusiastic about the uh, the topic that I just wanted to uh, keep talking. I know sometimes, too, when you talk with others, especially as you were uh, telling us uh, that you had talked with different people of different religious backgrounds, but it really sprouts from the same source, it seems, which is the Bible, one way or the other. And did you ever see sometimes a look of bafflement on people when you would say, but look, the Bible just says this here. You know, I'm not interpreting. Here it is right here. You know, did you ever see anybody or experience where they'd try to side skirt or rationalize something and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, what were some of the reactions that you would see from these different, I guess, sects, if you will, as you were sharing, you know, well, this is what I understand the Bible to mean literally, at least as, as it is written. Well, it's true. I think that uh, that the Bible is uh, is an interesting book because a lot of people, even religious people, don't know uh, what's in it because very few of us read it uh, cover mm-hmm. to cover. And I know I sure didn't before uh, I, I sat down on this quest. So if you bring up to people that law in Leviticus about grabbing private parts, uh, even religious people will look at you like that's in the Bible. They'll be shocked. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, there it is in, in black and white. And uh, so, it, part of the book is is sort of this uh, this Bible that you don't learn about in Sunday school, and and how do how do we interpret it, and and what does it mean, and what is the relevance of it, and and can we just ignore parts of the Bible because they they're uncomfortable. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio show, and our guest today, A.J. Jacobs, author of The Year of Living Biblically, joining us here on the program. Now, another one here that I've seen uh, as when we talk about the baffling rules to the 21st century mind is, it says here, and this is from Numbers 511 through 20, if you suspect your wife is cheating, you shall bring her to a priest who will mix a potion of barley, water, and dust, which the woman shall drink. If she's cheating, her stomach will swell. Well, that almost is a recipe for beer, so what about men? <laughs> well, it was interesting to learn about the uh, yeah, the, the laws for men because there uh, men, the adultery laws are not quite as strict for men oh, uh, no, in the Old not. Testament. It says... In the Old Testament, they were um, men were allowed to have uh, several wives. I mean, polygamy was not condemned. And I actually talked to the head of the uh, polygamy movement in America, who believes it's biblically justified. And and uh, I asked him, you know, well, sounds interesting, but how do I convince my wife to let me take on a second wife? Uh, and and he said, well, the trick is you don't ask her. You just go out and get married to the second wife and then bring her back and say, hey, look at what I've done. And it's a, <laughs> yeah, sort of a new hobby of mine here. Yeah. yeah, that one I decided not to follow because uh, I yeah. think my wife is a... Uh, After the reaction of the first rule that she had, you just didn't feel like doing, you know, standing around in the apartment was enough. That's right. I figured, uh, you know, I was I was going to commit to my project, but getting a divorce was not part of the uh, the, pro- the not part of the deal. But uh, yeah, my wife is a saint for putting up with it and uh, and all that. I will say though, there were parts of the year, the parts of the year that really enhanced our marriage. So uh, mm-hmm. because uh, I sh- again, she there was the Sabbath. She loved that I spent this day of the week uh, with the 
with the family. Uh, there was the fact that I became more reverent. I became more appreciative of religion. And uh, and at the end of the year, since we are officially Jewish, we actually did end up joining a temple. And uh, mm-hmm. we did decide to send my son to Hebrew school, uh, because uh, Sunday school, because whether or not um, – he becomes an atheist or a religious person, I'll be happy as long as he's a good person. I don't really care where he ends up. But I do want to give him just the basics in religion so that he knows what he's accepting or rejecting. So it definitely changed me, and I think my wife would say that uh, that she likes the way I changed, uh, although she did not like the uh, <laughs> the polygamy or the uh, mm-hmm. the menstruation rules. Well, those seem to also uh, kind of work themselves out as well, and you're now able to sit at most places in your apartment, right? That is true. I've gone back <laughs> to sitting in the chairs. Well, here's some other rules that you had here uh, that you came up with uh, from the Bible, that is. Uh, if you set your slave free after six years, but he decides to stay, then you shall bring him to the doorpost and bore a hole in his ear. Now, is that to say to pierce his ear, or, or is it literally right through the ear? Right through the air, uh, yeah, wow. actually. And that is one of the reasons why uh, Orthodox Jews don't pierce their ears, is that uh, it's considered a, a desecration of the body, and, and this is uh, cited as an example. And uh, I actually never never did that. But I did uh, decide, since slavery is such a big part of the Old Testament, I decided to try to uh, follow that in some way. And the closest I could come... Uh, in America was to get an intern, so uh, I got an intern to be my Hebrew slave, and uh, I have to say that was <laughs> one of the best parts of my year. Cause, uh, the because they worked asked, for free. <laughs> they worked for free, and he was wonderful, and uh, I was able to get him a byline in uh, Esquire magazine where I work, so, mm-hmm. so I guess that was some sort of payment, but, uh, but yeah, he was wonderful. He cooked me some Ezekiel bread from the Bible. The Bible's one of the few recipes in the Bible is this bread that the prophet Ezekiel ate, made of uh, made of lentils and and wheat and rye. It's actually quite good if you add honey. I found it's better to add honey. There you go. Now I noticed this one here was uh, kind of an interesting rule in and of itself. Is <clears throat> you shall not eat eagles, vultures, black vultures, red kites, black kites, ravens, horned or screech owl, gull or any kind of hawk, the little owl, the cormorant, the great owl, the white owl, the desert owl, the osprey, the stork, and any and any kind of heron, the hoopy or the hoopoe, I believe it is, and the bat. Well, that pretty much covers almost every bird except for maybe duck and quail, I guess. Yeah, that really put a crimp in my diet. I was, uh, I was what to eat? I can't eat stork. What am I going to do? Uh, yeah, this was part of the the Old Testament food taboos I tried to follow. So uh, there's what no... were some of the other food taboos that they had besides that particular one? Because I know that the reason they talk about fasting in the Bible, I believe, is so that you can purge yourself and then maybe perhaps change your diet uh, for health reasons. Well, they, certainly they said uh, no pork and no shellfish uh, in the Bible, so uh, I stopped eating those. And uh, interestingly, in the in the Bible, it does say that you're allowed to eat crickets. Most bugs are off limits, but crickets, grasshoppers, and locusts are are okay. So I decided to try to get into the mindset I would of my forefathers. I would try to eat a cricket, so I did, and it, it was chocolate covered. So I, uh, <laughs> I thought that, that was an easier, and it was crunchy and a little tangy, but not so bad. Uh, mm. And and this was another one. I, I I in the book I wanted to find out not just. Uh, not just follow the rules, but to try to figure out why they came about in the first place. Right. And uh, this one, I read an interesting theory about, you know, why would the Bible or God say it's okay to eat crickets? And it actually has an interesting pragmatic reason, and that is that if there was a an, a plague of locusts, then the locusts and crickets would would eat all of the crops. And right. so what were the ancient Israelites left with except the locusts themselves? So it was almost a pragmatic or merciful measure uh, in biblical times. Not and, to mention will, the abundance, yeah. Right. Uh, 
And following the food taboos was interesting because here was one where the rules at first seemed baffling, but then they did start to take on meaning after a while uh, because, uh, you know, you follow these rules and you start to really think about what you're putting in your body. And uh, and it... it 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 causes a, a mindfulness and a consciousness about eating. So eating no longer is just shoving food in. Eating becomes almost a spiritual activity, uh, one that you're really aware of your place in the in the bigger cycle. So that was quite interesting to me, and, and something I did not expect. I know it's amazing too, as you keep uh, referring about the rules in the Bible. That as you tried to live by them, and you became, you got to a point where you said, "Well, you know, let me try to understand what this is all about." You really see how it's about good spiritual right living in general. You know, regardless of the sect that it comes from, it's about as you said you were saying, you know, that what you wanted to share with your child is, you know, aspects of the Bible. So at least you've got sort of a groundwork to move forward to, to becoming a good person, regardless of which direction you decide to go. And it seems so ridiculous that so many people want to fight over who's right or wrong, when in general, the fighting is far from living right and being a good person, depending on what the fighting is all about. That's true. I definitely feel that the the, the golden rule, do unto others as uh, you would have them do unto you, I think that is the... Uh, the, the real key and uh, and and following the compassion and tolerance and uh, and loving thy neighbor in the Bible. Uh, I, one of the conclusions I came to was that uh, you know the Bible does have these this so much wisdom and, and wonderful advice uh, mm-hmm. and rules for living, but it also has some very troublesome ones. And I found that. I could not follow the entire Bible, uh, literally. I, I, if I did, I would. Uh, there were things I would do that were frankly crazy, like trying to stone an adulterer, um, and fun. And, and so I found that there is a certain amount of picking and choosing when it comes to following the Bible. And fundamentalists will say that this is a bad thing. They call this cafeteria religion. That you're just picking and choosing <laughs> different parts. Some of all life. people are saying that, right? <laughs> well, right. I feel that everyone does this cafeteria religion, and personally, I say there's nothing wrong with with cafeteria religion. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with cafeterias. I've had some delicious meals at cafeterias. <laughs> I've also had some horrible ones. So the key uh-huh. is to pick the right parts of the Bible, and with a spiritual advisor, maybe. Or, or or even on your own, pucking the parts about compassion and tolerance and loving your neighbor instead of focusing on the ones about, say, how homosexuality is a sin. So uh, it really, you have to engage the Bible, too. You can't just say, oh, the Bible says X, therefore I do X. I know it's interesting, you know, being in the Northwest where they, you know, was sort of like one of those grounds a couple of years ago where they were looking at homosexual marriage to become sort of a law so that people uh, in homosexual marriages can enjoy the same benefits as a regular marriage. And we were part of a Christian station at that one time, and it was just really hardcore, you know, just how anti-against that they were. And, uh, you know, so it's so when you take a look at the Bible, you know, it says one man, one woman, but I guess the belief under that would be is the fact that those are the only two that are capable of producing children, at, at least that would be my take on it. What was uh, interpreted, or how did you see that in the Bible? Well, it was. I, I mean, this was one of the one of the topics I touched on because I wanted to touch on as many relevant topics as I could, and, mm-hmm. and this was a particularly particular hot button issue. One of the fascinating trips I made was to visit a group of gay evangelicals. Uh, wow. evangelical Christians who are gay, which I thought was an oxymoron or, or <laughs> That's like being a conservative and being homosexual. You know, how can you do that? <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, but their argument is that uh, that Jesus would not condemn. Jesus did not condemn uh, a loving homosexual relationship. In fact, they have a. Um, they have a pamphlet that says, here's what Jesus said about homosexuality, and you open it up, and there's nothing in it. 
<laughs> Paul, Paul does talk about homosexuality being a sin. But their argument is that it's actually uh, referring to pagan sex rituals that, that they did at the pagan temples. And it was not referring to a loving, stable, homosexual relationship. So they they believe that, that, that gay, being gay and, and being a devout Christian is not a contradiction at all. And I actually also met uh, the first gay Orthodox Jewish rabbi. Who was so <laughs> Isn't it amazing how mysterious this world can be sometimes? <laughs> yeah, whatever you can think of, it's uh, it's going to be out there. I, I did. Uh, yeah, I love talking to both of those um, because also one of the big lessons of the year was was that all of my stereotypes were smashed. You know, whenever I met with a group, I would. Uh, I would learn that my preconceptions were were always off. Uh, for instance, evangelical Christianity, I definitely had a preconceived notion of what that was like, and uh, and it turned out to be it, it, it's such a vast and and varied movement that it's really hard to make uh, stereotypes about it. I met a group of evangelicals called Red Letter Christians, and these are uh, these are men and women who focus on the words of Jesus uh, that are were written in red letters in the old Bibles, and they say that uh, again Jesus never talked about homosexuality, um, but uh, he did talk a lot about helping the poor and the outcasts. So they focus their mission on helping the uh, helping the poverty stricken and uh, and and also the environment and peace. So. Uh, you know, it was very interesting to see the variety and uh, and learn all this. And I and I tried to go into each of these religious communities with an open mind. And so, even if I disagreed with them on many points, I, I tried to uh, at least see life from their point of view and try to understand it. And I will say, um, I was very pleased uh, because I uh, the book seen, has been well received by both the atheist and secular communities. And also by the religious communities, which is I, mean, I feel very blessed as you will. Um, and uh, I, this might count as uh, boasting, which is unbiblical. But I was very right. proud because last month I was on the I was on the cover of an evangelical Christian magazine, but I was also featured in Playboy and Penthouse. So I felt <laughs> that, that was a, an unusual uh, combination. Well, not really, because with those two magazines, that made you a polygamist, which is allowed in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> now it's interesting too when you know as you're sharing your experience by going to these many different groups to try to gain a better understanding as you said you know a foothold into seeing the fact that well you may have a stereotype about this group and i think <clears throat> oftentimes many of us just have that where we stereotype without understanding and you know it's to seek to understand and then be understood i suppose would be a good golden rule to follow but then you realize oh so that's what you guys are all about and why you're going this direction you know as you talked about the amish believe in making and manufacturing their own things so they're not dealing with technology even though in many ways they contribute to it but then you talk about the red letter christians you know and these people are all about helping the poor you know uh, uh, you know out of their situation <clears throat> so you realize that the Bible, even with its some 700-plus rules, is so diverse that it sprouts out such a plethora, if you will, for lack of a better word, of groups that just kind of live their own way as diverse as almost life itself. And it makes it quite incredible just to look at it, you know, pulling back and seeing the whole picture as you did. Oh, it's true. Uh, yeah, it's spawned thousands and thousands of communities and, and interpretations, and I loved exploring those. And, and the history of the interpretation is fascinating as well. And and also the difference between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and I talked a lot about that in my book, and the, and the concept of the, the law versus grace. And, and how much of uh, and whether we should follow the laws of the Old Testament, um, uh, or did Jesus' death uh, release us from those? Uh, so uh, you know, it, it is amazing that this one book has has caused so many different uh, communities and, and behaviors over thousands of years.
I think what's also interesting, too, about the Bible, I'd, th- I'd have to say I remember one of my first experiences, I guess, of the Bible really happened on the big screen, as probably for most people, and that was the movie uh, The Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille starring Charlton Heston. And you look at this and you think, well, was it really that way? You know, But as a child, you see the awe and the spectacle of it, but as you grow into an adult, you start saying, well, there's some pretty interesting things here. What does this really mean? And I remember the one uh, image that stuck with me that seemed to make sense, even as a child until I had grown up, is when they're marching around parading with the golden calf below, I believe it was Mount Sinai, where he was receiving the commandments. And, you know, thou shalt not put any other god before me was the whole idea of not worshiping other things, at least it seemed to me. And you take a look at how we are today, how we worship our toys and our electronics and our technology, and you can see how it drives us sort of mad for the next thing. And that seems to be an almost reasonable rule that's just, you know, as ancient as the Bible itself. Right. Yeah, you know, it is. Uh, it's absolutely idolatry is alive and well, I think, uh, and uh, worshiping of Hollywood celebrities. I mean, these are sort of the uh, the gods of of our time, you know, follow we, we we all read these in style and us weeklies and, and follow their lives as if they're Greek gods. And, uh, and, you know, I did try to cut that out. And I think uh, it was hard because, uh, you know, all these gossip magazines lying around, they're, they're quite <laughs> But I was able to uh, to do it to some extent. And, and I think I was a good person. I, I will say, uh, I mean, part of part, Part of the problem was that I work at Esquire magazine, which is right. not the most biblical of magazines. So, and, and my bosses decided to take advantage of this, and they decided to tempt the Bible guy, as they said. So they assigned me to write a profile of this uh, beautiful actress named Rosario Dawson, and I had to go to Los Angeles and, and try to interview her. And I, I couldn't, I you know, I didn't even want to look at her because she's quite beautiful. I didn't want to tempt myself uh, and and uh, and then she's a wonderfully uh, kind woman but she's also has the dirtiest mouth of anyone I've ever met in Hollywood. Wow. She was just t- telling me things that uh, that made me blush and um, so this was I had to say a lot of prayers that night just to uh, <laughs> and, and also another problem was that uh, I felt as a good journalist I should rent her movies and I uh uh, but but the problem was that her movies were R-rated, contained a lot of harlotry and coveting mm-hmm. and, and the like. So I actually I joined this service that will pre-censor the movies for you. They will take out all the naughty bits and send you a, a DVD, which is uh, sort of cleaned up. And so I did join them. And, um, uh, for instance, I rented uh, this movie called Alexander which Mm -hmm. Oliver Stone directed and she stars uh, uh, Rosario Dawson or or at least I think it stars Rosario Dawson because the version I saw, she hardly appeared at all. So uh, I can only imagine what was going on in the scenes that were uh, were cut out. Amazing. Now, um, what about uh, carrying a staff and drinking goat's milk? I know those had to be essentials and wearing sandals. (laughs) Well, they were not, yeah, they, there's no commandment that thou shalt wear sandals. But, but towards the end of the year, I did decide I would try to actually get into the mindset. So I did uh, I did do that, and I um, I had my uh, my staff, and, and I wore a lot of white clothes because mm-hmm. there's a line in Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament that says, your garments should always be white. And I decided to take that literally and, and walk around with white clothes. So I looked a bit like Tom Wolfe, the writer. Uh, <laughs> and interestingly, here was a lesson is that uh, it, the clothes actually affected my mood. I felt a little lighter and more spiritual just by wearing white. There's something about wearing white clothes that's very purifying and uplifting. I felt like uh, I can't be in a bad mood if I'm about to look like I'm about to play the semifinals at Wimbledon. Uh, mm-hmm. So... Uh, and it actually spoke to an even larger theme in the book, which was how much the outer affects the inner, how much your behavior affects your thoughts. So uh, for much of the year, I was almost pretending 
to be a better person. Uh, and I, be, I think I became a little bit of a better person. So uh, I had always thought that, you know, your mind affects your, your actions. But often mm-hmm. it's the other way around. Your actions, your behavior affects your mindset. Uh, so you, if you behave in a certain way, then you start to think that way. If you go visit uh, friends in the hospital, then you start to become more compassionate. It's almost like you're tricking your mind. Uh, oh, well, I'm here in the hospital. I must be compassionate. And and then uh, you start to think of yourself as compassionate. It's quite amazing, too, how you can use the Bible. I think what's good about this book, which is the Year of Living Biblically, and our guest today, A.J. Jacobs, joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program, is that when you produce a book like this, you grab the opportunity to get a hold of a group or an audience, if you will, of people who normally might just shy away from it because of how they may have grown up where religion was just one of those things they just couldn't stand it because of how their family or friends may have turned out. I'm just turning it down entirely. I just don't want anything to do with it. They become atheists. And you realize that, you know, in using the Bible, which, you know, I do from time to time, I guess, but is that there are some really golden pearls of wisdom that you don't have to be religious, but if you just, you know, as you said, use the cafeteria plan, can really help you live a better life and perhaps a life that you're more interested in living for yourself. I I think you're absolutely right, and I found that. uh, I mean, spiritually, it was a very interesting year for me because I had grown up, as you say, with no religion whatsoever. Or, you know, like I said, the bad taste in your mouth for religion based on an experience that you had that was very negative in religion, so to speak. Right. And yeah. certainly for the first, uh, I mean, bad religion, it can be very, very bad. And, uh, and it does uh, cause uh, some horrible, some of the worst, uh, acts of human history have been uh, committed in the name of religion. Uh, but at the same time, some of the best uh, acts in human history have been committed in the name of religion. So uh, good religion can be very, very good. Bad religion can be very, very bad. Um, and uh, spiritually, I definitely evolved because I started out as this, uh, I started out as an agnostic and by the end of the year, I became what a minister friend of mine calls a reverent agnostic, which is a term I love, uh, because whether or not there's a God, I, I believe in the uh, importance of sacredness in our lives and that rituals can be sacred or that uh, that our family time can be sacred or the Sabbath can be sacred, even prayer, prayer can be sacred. Um, and And so this has definitely stayed with me. Uh, I remain an agnostic, but in a very different way. Mm-hmm. Well, that would only make sense, too. Now, I know that as we've been doing our Beyond 50 radio program here for going on four years now and uh, had the wonderful opportunity to be online where we could reach potentially a worldwide audience, <clears throat> is that uh, one of the things that we've seen in America was the decline in the respect of our elders, it seems, as though we're casting them off you know, your time is done, and so forth. But one rule that I see here, and it's interesting that I bring this up because of a show that we did a few weeks ago about uh, of a lady who was 63 years old who, with her husband, had walked the entire length of the Gobi Desert. Mm. Now, just imagine that for a minute. And it isn't because of their age that makes it so interesting. That's a part of it. But when you consider the tremendous risks of running across drug smugglers and, of course, the Chinese Border Patrol, and it was really interesting their experience being elderly and being in an area that they shouldn't have been in, which was within less than a mile of the Chinese border, which apparently you're not supposed to be if you're traveling and you have permission. If you're within less than a mile, then they could detain you, throw you in jail, and and who knows what's going to happen. But... They noticed that they had extra respect paid for them because that's how they were raised in those countries was to respect the elders. And here you have this particular rule, you shall stand in the presence of the elderly. Tell us about that one. Yeah, I love that one because uh, that is one of my favorite rules is respecting the elderly. Because as you say, I think that this society uh, really worships youth in, in a disturbing way. 
And uh, as I'm getting older and older, that becomes more and more disturbing to me. Uh, What's funny about worshiping youth is how much we beat up on them in horror films. (laughs) 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 No, really. I mean, all of our uh, whatever you want to call them toward the youth is really taken out on them in horror films. So, you know, you call that worship? That's kind of strange. But anyway. (laughs) (laughs) We are the ones that are featured in the horror films. Uh, uh, I guess maybe some of the older directors like to be up on them. Yeah. Uh, but the uh, yeah, so this was uh, I loved this part of the Bible because in ancient times uh, the elderly, you really did have to um, uh, be reminded to uh, to respect the elderly because the uh, the temptation would be to leave them behind because say the elderly couldn't help you put up the tent. Uh, uh, so you had to be reminded uh, that the, that the elderly should be treated with respect. You uh, and your parents. Uh, the, the, the Bible says that uh, it's one of the Ten Commandments: honor your parents. Uh, and and it's actually one of the only commandments where it promises something in return. If you honor your parents, then you will live a long life. Uh, and so uh, you know you can tell your kids that. Uh, they should honor your, their parents uh, because it actually helps them. It's going to make their life longer. Uh, and and there's a part in the Bible that says you shall stand in the presence of the elderly. Uh, you shouldn't just respect them. You should actually stand up in their presence to show your respect. And uh, I had decided to follow that it's in the Bible, so um, that was a... Uh, an unusual situation. Uh, I, I did go to a wedding in Florida, and I was at a restaurant, uh, you know, and, and at about 5 p.m. in Florida. And uh, so, you know, you can imagine this was there were quite a few elderly <laughs> Really people. building the pattern of the belief. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the place to do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in the center, the White Hot Center of, uh, mm. of elderly people. So I, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, standing up and sitting down. I sort of looked like I was playing a solitaire version of, uh, of musical chairs. My wife was, uh, was baffled by it. Probably about as baffled as she was when you smashed your fa- her fake Oscar statuette. What was that all about? Yeah, that one I was trying to do uh, to to live out uh, the commandments to smash the idols. And mm-hmm. uh, since I figured that this was the closest uh, we had in, in America to actual idols was the Oscar statue, uh, I thought I'd uh, do that. And I actually did not write about that in the book. There were... There, I could have written uh, eight or nine books based on all the experiences, and that one was was interesting, but I didn't feel it was so fascinating that I needed to include it. So I, um, it doesn't actually appear in the book, uh, but there are, there were lots of other adventures that that I felt uh, were even more compelling. Now, uh, one of the rules that you talk about, it's really interesting. Some of the ones that I have highlighted here you know, just in simple application could really transform a person. I mean, we talked earlier in the in the Beyond 50 radio program about gossip, and you realize that when somebody is talking about someone else, it's never really a positive thing that they're saying. And what you end up doing is affixing a negative emotion or an, a negative situation in your own mind that really applies to you. We always hear, you know, that what angers you about others is what angers you about yourself. And so when you enjoy seeing or listening to or participating in gossip, you know, you're really chewing somebody up that isn't there. What you're really doing is you're taking a relishing moment about chewing yourself up about something that bothers you inside yourself. So you can see how stopping the gossip and turning away sort of helps you get away from those negative thoughts that sustain anger, you know, or negative behavior. And I can see just, you know, even if you don't even want to be religious, as we've suggested, if you just apply some of these rules, as you said, it really transformed you. And that was just in a course of a year. Just imagine a person transforming themselves, you know, in the entire course of a lifetime. It must be very liberating. Yeah, and I did love, actually, the uh, the gossip rules, Uh because I did, it did make me realize just how much. Once you start to pay attention to how much, right? How much of it's going on? Uh, and I will say the, um, 
It, it was interesting to watch because, uh, again, I, I forced myself not to gossip, forced myself not to say negative things about people. And uh, I watched as uh, I, I began to have less of an urge to say negative things about people. Uh, it was almost as if my thoughts were uh, said to themselves, well, the negative thoughts said, well, we're never going to get out into the atmosphere, so why should we even bother forming? It was almost like they knew that it was futile. And so I began to have a much more positive outlook on life and on people, and I think I've been able to retain that. Um, one of the interesting things was uh, that that uh, Orthodox Jews actually take this no gossiping commandment very seriously. Uh, it's called evil tongue, uh, mm-hmm. Lashon Hara. And, uh, and, and uh, there's actually a hotline. Like, the, you know, there's a suicide hotline, but this is a gossip hotline. You can call these rabbis who will, if you have the urge to talk to gossip, they'll talk you down from the ledge. And uh, <laughs> I spent quite a bit of time on the gossip hotline. Uh, That's interesting. <laughs> the Jewish gossip hotline. That's it. <laughs> I just have a funny picture, you know, of a bunch of smiling, long-bearded Jews. Just, come on, join on board. It's just, I don't know, it's just kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll give you the number. If you want. <laughs> Put that on our website there for people, you know, in case you need to gossip, then we need to slow that <laughs> down, and you'll realize just how dysfunctional a behavior like that is. That's Another it. one, too. Another one, too, that I like comes from uh, Proverbs 19.11, and it's from the story of Jonah about how to be slow to anger. And you take a look at what, you know the state we're in in the world today, and there's a lot of paranoia, a lot of anger going on, a lot of misunderstanding, it seems. You know, how to a level, when we see that type of, of, of anger and, and misunderstanding going on in the world, you know, we have the war in Iraq going on, People are worried about, you know, the birth of China as far as a superpower, India and the like, and how the United States has created seemingly mistrustful relations where we were once allegedly a good country and good standing with a lot of countries, but now we're not trusted some more. How do we rise to a level above that to maybe get that standing back again where everybody can just take it easy, you know, for a change? Maybe call the Jewish gossip hotline, I guess. But, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, from the book of Jonah, what did you learn about be slow to anger? Well, this was a big struggle for the year because I think, uh, you know, we are too angry in this society. And my wife pointed it out to me when I, uh, I remember I took some money out of the ATM and uh, it charged me. Two dollars and seventy-five as a fee, uh, and I was outraged. And I gave the finger to the ATM, and my wife said, well, <laughs> "You start making obscene gestures at, at inanimate objects." And I'm going to make this machine stuff. cry if it's the last thing I do. <laughs> yeah, it was unsuccessful. Uh, it's still working. But yet, yeah, so the uh, I, I did decide that in my biblical year to try to to be slow to anger as the as the Bible says, and and there's much to be learned uh, about that. One of the one of them uh, one of the lessons is in the book of Jonah, where uh, it, it, this is the book where Jonah is swallowed by a whale um, and, and then spit out. Uh, and but there's a, a lesser known part of the book where where Jonah is uh, he he goes to an evil city. God tells him to go to this evil city of Nineveh and uh, and try to preach to them and, and make them see the error of their ways. And uh, and basically Jonah gets annoyed because uh, he wanted God to smite the city. He wanted the city. He wanted some fire and brimstone, and he didn't get it. And, and basically God taught him a lesson. God provided him an instant tree that provided shade for Jonah from the hot sun and then the day the next day God took that tree away and Jonah was shocked and angry and and God he he complained to God and God said basically not in these words but God said get some perspective what i was trying to teach you was get some perspective you're all angry about the, this tree that provided shade that I gave you. You should be thankful for that tree. Uh, I took it away to show you uh, that these things are fleeting. You're getting angry at this trivial thing, and uh, whereas I, uh, I should be, uh, and you're blaming me for not being, uh, for not uh, raining 
fire and brimstone don't, down on this town. So get some perspective, Jonah. You know, that's a very interesting point of view, especially as we consider our roles in the workplace where we go to a job that provides food and shelter for our families and ourselves, yet we go to work and we find that we don't like the boss. We don't like the way they're doing things, even though it's not our business. And you can see how you know a particular rule like that would apply thoroughly, like just as you said, being thankful for what I've given you of the simple things, yeah. rather than well, thinking of them other than as they should be. Right. Well, it is. Uh, that was one of the huge, huge lessons of my year was gratefulness, and uh, I, I was uh, I said many, many prayers of Thanksgiving, and and I le- it totally changed my perspective. It was a mm-hmm. radical shift because I started to be thankful for the 100 things that go right every day instead of focusing on the three or four that go wrong. That and, really absorb your whole day too. Yeah. I know that's what I tried. I used to focus on, and, and I, it's always a struggle. I still do sometimes, but uh, but if you just try to think about, uh, you know, I did not get in a car accident today. I, uh, you know, the the bus did not run out of gas and did not get a flat tire. I did not uh, get electrocuted. I did not cut myself <laughs> while shaving. I mean, there are thousands of things that go right every day, and we should be thankful that uh, that they do. Uh-huh. That's beautiful. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program, and our guest today, A.J. Jacobs, and his book, Living the Bible, The Year of Living Biblically, I'm sorry. Now, I understand that there's a possibility uh, that there's a movie in the work on this? That's true. It was uh, was bought by Hollywood. Uh, The Year of Living Biblically was bought by uh, Paramount Pictures and actually Brad Pitt's uh, production company. So uh, I don't think Brad would be playing me, but uh, you never know. Kind of makes you wonder how it's going to turn out, if it's going to be anything like maybe the transformation and the experience that you had while you were doing this. And you just kind of wonder from time to time, you know, how it's all going to turn out. But we hope for the best anyway. I mean, after talking, you know, with people such as Mike Farrell, formerly of MASH, you know, how they can transform things into something other than what it was meant to be. But we certainly hope that if they make it a movie that it's as enjoyable as what you've shared here with us on the program. Now, as you've been... Yeah, as you've been re- as you were reading through the Bible, you know, with all the characters, you look at some powerful ones. You have Moses, you have Abraham, you have David and Goliath, you have Jesus, and and it's, you know, just all these pinnacle figures, if you will. What really stood out and grabbed you the most as you read uh, through the Bible? That you know, obviously, there were all the rules that you tried to live by or you lived by at the best that you could that transformed you, but what really transformed you in the way that you see the world today? Well, I think a lot of what we talked about, gratefulness uh, and and, uh, acting in a certain way and actually becoming that person, so how much the outer changes the inner. Uh, As far as biblical characters go, uh, you know, I was, uh, I I found much wisdom in in many of the ones you mentioned, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, but uh, there was actually uh, one story that I found very inspiring, and it's actually not in the Bible itself. It's a, uh, a sort of a Jewish folklore tale, uh, and it was about a guy named Nakshon. And uh, this story involves the time that uh, Moses parted the Red Sea. And uh, in the movie version, you know, Moses comes up, he lifts his staff, and the sea parts. But according to this tale, that's not how it happened. Moses lifted up his staff, and nothing happened. The sea just stayed there, and the Egyptians were were closing in. And uh, Moses didn't know what to do. Finally, an Israelite named Nachshon just walked into the water. He walked in, and the water came up to his knees, up to his waist, up to his neck, and right before it came up to his nose, the seas parted. And the the point is, sometimes you just have to dive in. Sometimes you just have to do it, as uh, they say on the Nike commercials. Just miracles happen when you uh, when you dive in or wade in. And so that is almost uh, my motto for the year. I uh, I could have spent uh, 15 years studying the Bible and still not have been prepared, but I decided just to wade in and see how the Bible would change my life, and, and it was remarkable and how it did. 
That's certainly the advice we give when we do our base, uh, business basics series, that's for sure. Just jump in. You can research all you want, but until you get in the water, you'll never learn how to swim. <laughs> exactly. That's it. Well, we want to thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Our guest today, A.J. Jacobs, and the book is The Year of Living Biblically. Now, I know you have a website where people can go and get some of these great clothes and even the 10-string harp that is uh, suggested to play as well. Uh, that's true. I have a website, ajjacobs.com, and, uh, of course, it's available on uh, Amazon and and all of those, and uh you know, it was uh, it is on the New York Times bestseller list, so I feel very lucky about that. And well, you so. tackled a huge subject, and I thought that you know I haven't had the opportunity to read the book yet, but I am looking forward to it. But again, I think what it does, if it does anything miraculously, is it will get people who may have disdained religion from whatever their experiences were, as to maybe kind of revisit that and say, you know, what. What is it that I may be missing that I might be able to get from this? And so you'll see yourself kind of way up there as well as the Bible itself, it sounds like. <laughs> I hope so. And I've also <clears throat> heard from lots of religious people who say that it's helped them understand the secular point of view and, uh, and you know, that these people are not evil <laughs> and they're not out to, uh, to, get to, you. <laughs> to degrade the world. But uh, <laughs> So hopefully it's, it's able to provide some perspective. Well, thank you again for taking the time to join us on the Beyond 50 radio program today. Oh, thank you for having me. You betcha. Our guest today, A.J. Jacobs, and his book, The Year of Living Biblically, joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. We want to thank you for joining us today, and remember, we'll be here next week, next Friday, from noon to one Pacific Standard Time, and be sure to tune in. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us today, and be sure to visit our website, beyond50radio.com. That is 50 with a 5-0. Sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter. Thank you again for tuning in, and remember, live your day past halfway.